I look the prettiest. Yeah. Not of us, of other videos with me. That's what I meant. Oh, we all know what you meant. <laughs> The container is now open. Don't just get triggered. Get enlightened. Wait, that's the message of today's guest. The one, the only, Susan Campbell. So as we explore the world of Eros in this spirit forward perspective, our guest Susan Campbell gives us this major insight that every time your lover triggers you, which they definitely will, mm -hmm. It's a chance to do important inner work and that's going to catapult you into new levels of consciousness. So for 40 years, Susan's been writing practical guides on this exact kind of thing, living a happier, more authentic life. And she's done a lot of focus on romantic relationships. In particular, she's written this, uh, it's kind of the Bible of authentic relating. And also this book, From Trigger to Tranquil, which Sai and I actually use. That's why we're so tranquil. <laughs> and so triggered. <laughs> to find Susan Campbell's books or book a session with her as a therapist or coach, go to her website, susancampbell.com. And keep an eye out for part two of our interview where she actually gives us a live coaching session so you get to see the principles in action until then here is your interview with susan campbell susan campbell welcome to the container. We are so excited to have you on because this is very important because uh, about a year ago, I purchased this book, <laughs> Getting Real. Uh, it comes very highly recommended. Um, and then recently we had an interview with Jason Diggs on this big two-part interview on the history of circling and his firsthand account of the authentic relating movement. And what book came up as like, a, you know, must read books in the movement that helped, um, yeah, build the foundation of authentic relating. And yeah, it, it, it's very clear to me now that you're like a major, um, yeah, you're like a, a foremother of the movement. You're um you're responsible for so many important ideas crystallizing and reaching the page. And so it's a great honor to have you here. Thank you, Jonathan. Mm. I'll just take that in. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so I would like to start with just getting a quick bio of how how you went from um a human in the world to someone who was alert to these practices as ways to build deeper connection and yeah like live a more spirit forward life okay well i'll try to make this brief but i did start noticing something a miss or dysfunctional in our culture when I was a teenager. Uh, this was the 50s, okay, the 50s. <laughs> Everybody tried to conform and you know be normal and that sort of thing and hide their weaknesses, not ask for help. I mean, although, see, I just thought, well, what kind of a world is this where people can't show vulnerability, can't be honest with each other because it might be a little bit painful. So I've been on on this honesty path for a long time mm. and i had a lot of you know you said i'm this foremother or something but i had a lot of teachers and i was part of the early encounter group movement esalen etc but i used to we, we were pioneering in those days so I, I used to try out all these different experimental games huge large group games where you'd you'd close your eyes 
and mill around with 300 people and find somebody's hand and get really connected to their hand. And you, you can kind of imagine, you know, a lot of eroticism starting to come up in these groups. <laughs> yeah. You know, then you'd um, have to later on find their hand again, and you're not going to find their hand, but you know, you're you're getting kind of intimate hand touch with a lot of people in groups, and then that brings up all kinds of dynamics and jealousy and this and that. So, I mean, we were kind of pushing the edges, um, and there was wrestling in the groups, you know, physical wrestling, and sometimes people would get hurt. Uh, I was with my husband in one group, and you know, we just couldn't communicate verbally. So we started fighting. I mean, this, this was the wild west of group work. Okay. So I was part of that and T groups. I was also one of the early T group leaders. And so a lot of what I teach, it kind of started there and, and Gestalt therapy, Fritz Perls, and, and so, so many of the people who taught encounter groups and so forth were either students of Fritz Perls or Carl Rogers. So I want to name those early pioneers. Mm. Carl Rogers used to do completely unstructured groups where you just sit in a circle and you know, he wouldn't give any instruction whatsoever. And you know, you'd just be anxious as hell, you know, <laughs> because nobody's giving you any structure. And then I've played around with, with that from time to time when I teach group dynamics at a college level and so forth, all the different leadership styles that determine how the group develops and you know whether there's fear of each other or a feeling of love and safety depends a lot on the style or the intention of the leadership and the structure you make. So anyway, you know, now I'm acting like a college professor because I I was a college professor for 12 years at UMass and taught you know, group dynamics and stuff. So I've always been interested in what inhibits people from revealing their, basically their needs, you know, their needs and wants, because that's the motivator. And we could call it Eros, you know, that's the motivator, the need for, for food, touch, love, sex, um, what's so inhibiting about that? What's so scary about that? And of course, we we know logically what is scary about that. You know, you might not get what you want, and that's associated with a lot of times really that being a survival issue when you were young. You know, if not getting what you want happened when you were young in a serious enough way, that whole issue is associated with survival. And you know, that would bring me up to my latest book, From Trigger to Tranquil, but I, I won't necessarily go there now. But um, so then I kept teaching. You know, I quit UMass, but I just kept teaching my own seminars and evolving my work. And, and I've got 11 books. So um, each book is a different stage in my own development. But one that you might be interested in knowing about is The Couple's Journey where I put forth the idea of intimate relationship as a spiritual practice, where as you go through your conflicts, you start with the romance stage, but then you have a stage where you differentiate and go through differences and conflicts and disappointments. That's the stage where you really get to do a lot of inner work, heal yourself. And then as you continue to heal yourself and become more whole, you become a, a, almost like a different order of human where you really do feel the unity of all things. You know, through the couple's journey, you eventually get to what I imagine you guys might be experiencing, the co-creation stage, you know? <laughs> and that was yeah. so many of the people I interviewed, and this was in the late 70s, and the book came out in 1980. So many people wanted that, wanted a partner that we have enough in common with, but also enough complementarity where we could join and present something to the world together. And so there's certain challenges with that, which maybe I'll come back later when we work together and uh, help you look at if there are challenges. I'm just making an assumption here. Mm. We'll see. 
<laughs> so, um, you know, The Couple's Journey was one seminal book. It actually sold extremely well. It's my bestseller. It, it sold over 100,000 copies right away. I haven't had a book that sold that much since, you know, even getting real. It's been popular, but, you know, it didn't take off. Like, no, The Couple's Journey was at the right place at the right time when so many people were both spiritually seeking and having trouble with their relationships. Mm. So that book was kind of the intersection. And then if we just uh, fast forward, I did a lot. I did a lot of corporate work and um, wrote a book called From Chaos to Confidence, trying to help people be more honest in the workplace and use the challenge of being honesty, honest as a self-awareness practice. So you know, I was a meditator and and I learned actually a lot about what comes up when you just sit quietly with yourself and just let it bubble up. Um, that would be the material in the book, Getting Real actually, was informed a lot by my meditation practice. But during the more corporate and systems work, that was a very hard environment for people it, this is, again, 80s and 90s now we're talking about a very hard environment for people to deal with emotions. Now, I think the corporate world is much more able to incorporate people's emotions, but they just didn't want to hear it back in the early days. Um, so I, then there was this whole Getting Real series of, of books that um, started out with the idea of yeah, we all value honest communication. You now we say we want to be honest, but do we really have the honesty skills? And what let's break down some of the skills for being honest. And of course, being present and paying attention and noticing what's going on inside of you, your feelings, thoughts, and stories, and then what you see and what you imagine and what you want, you know, those basic presencing skills that's what the book getting real is about mainly and then you know a few more books about getting real it was one called saying what's real and one called truth and dating which i want to highlight here because the theme of truth in dating was truth telling is sexy because you're always on the edge of the unknown with somebody when you're taking a risk and, and speaking an intimate truth and then sort of evolved into being as, as I've gotten more I'm I'm just gonna say aware of all the levels of a of a human being and how much childhood really affects your present relationships. That's when I started doing more work with triggers and emotional reactivity that comes up when your partner disappoints you because they didn't say it the way you wanted them to say it, you know? And uh, so working with those inner reactions again, but in a way, again, like the couple's journey where you're helping each other heal, you're present to hearing what happened inside the other person when they were triggered. Of course, they have to first inquire into it and then you come back and, and talk about it because so often we just can't, help it when we're triggered it's automatic yes because it's connected to survival and often the survival of not getting some early need met a actual valid need so um yeah that brings that brings me up to date in um my professional history and it it was always whatever i'm working on at the time that's what i'm writing about wow something you just said um, reminded me that one of the ways I know that it's a real trigger is that I find myself triggered. <laughs> like I find myself triggered, right? It's not, I'm approaching trigger. It's, you know, there's a different thing that's like, I'm getting a little more and a little more close to that state of activation. It's like, I, I find myself in the state, <laughs> right? You're already in it. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, it's so quick. <laughs> That's the way most people are. And it takes, you know, they can be tr you know, triggered for five or 10 minutes and speaking from that place until they go, whoops, I'm triggered. Whoop. 
but See? of course I'm trying to help people notice the earlier warning signals mm -hmm. so you can feel it coming and ask for help and ask for reassurance. Yeah, I'm, I'm noticing you even mentioned how a book like Getting Real comes out of a meditative practice. And I think for me, meditation and group meditation like circling really has has completely been the, the basis of me understanding when I'm triggered. Um, yeah, I, I think before those practices, when I got triggered, I actually would think like, wow, I'm really right. And this person is really dead wrong right now. <laughs> what it, you know, that's what triggered seemed like to me while I was in it. And then those practices, um, yeah, they are everything for me. They, they were so important, especially circling was so important for me to be aware enough in the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that that makes me think about how in our relationship, me and Sai, but then also in all of my relationships now, those triggering events are moments of massive opportunity and personal yes. growth. Absolutely. And yeah, and, and I would like to hear um, you speak more on this idea of how the romantic partnership is such a like a powerhouse of personal growth. Yeah, if you could speak. Well, more. the romantic relationship mimics the parent-child relationship in the sense that you have some dependency, you, you grow into dependency on one another. Oh, it's mm. just, oh, I, 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 I need your presence to feel loved and safe. Oh, however you think about it, it just kind of over time you you get a bond. And if you didn't bond well with your first caregiver, like usually it's the mother, um, then that's probably because there was some kind of mismatch between what the mother could give and what the child needed. So right away, they're in the bonding phase, there's an um, opportunity to get triggered. Um, so when I wrote the book Truth and Dating, it was all about how you don't have to be a long-term couple for this kind of stuff to come up. But let me just go back to the, the long-term or the you know, more bonded couple. So um, one of the ways that it makes the couple relationship is such a powerful container for knowing what your childhood unfinished business is, is because I, you know, you're my mommy and my daddy in some ways. Uh, and yet, you know, I'm, I'm not promoting that, but it just, it just seems to be what is. So and I guess that's, that's the main, you know, that that's the main reason. And then um, the other reason is when you have a, a, a sexual need that gets um, met with, with this, let's say it's just one other person you're doing this with, um, it's more motivating to keep working on things. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't care about the person, you know, okay, the, the grocery store person triggered me, you know, I'm not going to work on my stuff. I'll just blame them and move on. <laughs> <You know? laughs> We're beyond, we're beyond the blaming thing. I mean, I really am way you know, beyond the blaming thing, but still it's, 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 it's kind of a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we do secretly kind of blame people, you know, and let's, let's just admit that. Yeah, but the idea that I don't want to lose what we have. And then farther you go, and maybe you have kids together and finances together. There's all this motivation to work it out. So mm -hmm. that's just a very practical reason why people do, do better in couples counseling with me, let's say, if they've got more at stake. But even in dating, that's the thing. People think there's so much at stake. So, so great. Go ahead and do the couple's journey with somebody that you've only met for a month or two. You know, 
you can still do it because it's gonna you, you, you you're gonna get some kind of disappointment or frustration uh, in any time you stay with one person long enough because you're gonna start differentiating in the beginning. I would say the romance stage is, is for the purpose of bonding and getting safe with each other and that sort of thing. So it's almost like nature's way of providing a container that's um, friendly enough, safe enough for you to do this deeper work, which then I called it the power struggle stage. Mm. Doesn't mean you're fighting all the time, but it means you're, you're, you're getting let down or disappointed or angry. That's where the that's where the real fun begins if you're into growth. <laughs> I'm curious. Um, I kind of want to hang out on the dating stage for a second. Um, a thought came to mind about how triggering, especially in well bonded pairs or any, I guess, you know, romantic setup. A lot of that comes out of dependency, which is interesting to me. That's that really tracks like if if I have a lot of needs dependent on you, then me getting a sense you're not going to fill my needs is really important because I'm depending on you so I can get triggered. Um, but then I'm I'm wondering if there is like a similar practice to working through your stuff that you discover through being aware of your triggers if in the dating phase there's also is there a similar like yoga you can do with arousal or desire like is there a way that mm. the things that attract us to people and make us like wow I can't get that person out of my head like there is something about that that might be a um you know the metal detector on the beach finding your your stuff that you need to work on. I wonder, uh, yeah, I'm curious what you think about that. Just pick up on, and uh, and then I'd like to see if this matches anything you were thinking, but if I'm in the, I can't get you out of my head, that can bring up thoughts and stories and past memories about things that don't have anything to do with us that can trigger me. So I'm Mm. basically triggering myself with my own worries. You know, doesn't mm. sort of happen. I mean, those of us who are single, yeah. not, but, you know, people who are listening are single. Can you kind of, that kind, kind of, yeah, you can get triggered even if you just met the person because you're thinking it too much. <laughs> I can think of many examples, many, many examples. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm remembering like, many times in my life when those first maybe the first month or two months or something where you don't have a lot of security in the connection that's right yeah and there are so many times where it's like you can't get a good read and then you're like oh well you know what then never mind I guess you know like there's so many times that the insecurity blows me up or for me, it would be the almost the opposite of like, I have to cling more since I'm not getting the right signals. Like I have to like lean in more rather than forget it, you know? Like I I had like that in early stages of connection, like um, almost like a, almost like a desperation, you know, to like make sure everything was going to be just right and you know like try to predict what what was going to happen next and you know imagine imagine scenarios and try to direct things in certain ways i mean those are those are all yeah well this this early stage of dating is a very insecure time you know as jonathan was kind of saying and then do you want me to call you sarah or sigh cuz Ooh, I prefer Sai. Thank you. Sai. Okay. So Sai, you are doing this thing that, you know, that, that I call kind of controlling. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Of putting the book getting real. Are we relating, which leaves a lot of room for the unknown because I say something and then I don't over explain it. I just kind of wait to see what comes back. That's relating a lot of uncertainty. Uh, but most of us do try to manage a relationship so it doesn't so it feels safe even if you kind of don't feel safe in the background and and so when like you're in that state of pursuing in a certain way or 
making yourself more desirable. I don't know all the different control mechanisms. I call them control patterns that people use to influence the outcome. That's what I mean by controlling. I don't mean you're a control freak type of, you know, you got to have things your way. It's more, it come, the need to control comes from insecurity. It's about trying to make sure that the consequences are not too painful for you. So that's what we're all trying to control mainly is uh, emotional pain. Yes. And the work is gently going into the emotional pain. Like if we were working right now, Sai, I'd be going, okay, remember the time that you, you know, were kind of going like this with <laughs> partner or potential partner. What's the, what's the feeling? And just have you inquire. And this is the trigger work, you know. Okay, there's any kind of disturbance in my peace of mind, let's say. That's the point of entry for trigger work, even if it's not like a literal you know, reaction to trauma. Um, you just feel, oh, you mentioned, I think, desperate. Okay, so you, you describe it. You feel the sensations. And and you might have a place in your body where it really shows up strongly. And pretty soon, what often emerges is other times in your past when you felt this similar feeling and maybe even a childhood memory. And you get, you know, you get a picture of, oh, daddy left when I was five or something. And, oh, what, what can I do to not have him go? Uh, I get stories like that yes. and we can go, let's get to know that five-year-old and let's tune into her world and feel her and you, you create space. It's, it is <clears throat> to a degree similar to meditation in which you through, I use the breath, through the breath, that just naturally opens up a bigger space for feelings and let's say uncomfortable things to to come in. It's almost like a you're creating your own safe container, safe space. And you hold that space for that five-year-old and empathy comes in and love and tenderness and sadness and grief. Different things will come in. And just by being with the places that cause pain or that are associated with pain, you do increase your capacity for holding a charge, whether it's a sexual charge or an emotional charge, you know, like for living more life with containing more energy rather than having to impulsively take an action to suppress uh, uncomfortable mm -hmm. things. So that's what that's what the trigger work is for. Yes. I'm, I really want to hang out at that that last point you made, which is really important for me to hear. So I, I want to selfishly say here. Yeah, that um that the work is simply when you're aware of the emotions to a simply to simply make space for them and feel them and just um be as present as you can with them. And there's no complicated thing you have to do there's no like magic ritual that <laughs> will turn it into you know money or whatever it's just sitting with it and letting it be all that it is in you um would you say that's that's a fair like kind of reflection of your point yes yes and there's often a kind of there's the witness self that's holding the space and there's like the much loved child that's hurting and needing comfort in some way it's it's almost like you're able to be aware of 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 both identities because mm. part, part of this deeper purpose of all this relationship as a spiritual practice work is to get beyond identifying with, I've got to control things in order to avoid pain. You know, get beyond all the ego identifications and just feel more one with life. 
and and there's like an inner peace that can grow from learning to sit with those painful feelings. Mm -hmm. But sometimes people have hard a hard time having compassion for themselves. And I'll do different things, but sometimes I might suggest, could you imagine that this part of yourself that was causing you this distress is like a much loved child who you you really care about and just kind of make make that suggestion. So I do my in my therapy coaching practice, I don't make a distinction between therapy and coaching the way I do things. But in that in that working with clients, I I just help help them learn to sit with things longer than you ordinarily would sit with things. That's mm -hmm. that's the key. You know, and also not expect you to never have that feeling again. Like don't expect to never get triggered again. That could happen, you know, because you get more spacious, you get more aware of more of reality. That's the whole idea of getting real is being able to handle more of reality uh, rather than because when you're triggered, you've got a very narrow focus. And you know, I only I only see the option of oh either you win or I win, that type of thing. Mm. Yeah, the in the From Trigger to Tranquil book, which Sai and I have used in our own relationship, the, the process essentially is like once you notice that you're um, triggered, you, you go into your pause agreement. And part of that is like going off on your own and giving yourself compassion around your being triggered. And um, yeah, I'd kind of forgotten that in my gloss. And when you brought it up, I remember like just how uh, that changed so much my relationship to myself and the expectations I have around like how I should be showing up or how I should be affected by someone else. Almost like I have the experience of being too proud to admit I am triggered, which makes me unable to not be triggered. Beautiful. I love yeah. That. Yes. yeah. Yeah. And when I first, when I wrote that five minute relationship repair book, that was about triggers and couples. I realized that I needed a whole chapter in my next book on accepting the fact that we do get triggered. I didn't have that in the other book. I went, Oh no, this is, I mean, I can teach all these skills, but people are still, and, you know, I teach a lot of coaches and I'll say to the coaches, how many people don't believe that it's normal and natural to get triggered? But then the next question, they raise their hand, then how many people still think there's something wrong with you when you get triggered? And everybody raises their hand. So that's where the culture is right now. That's my read on it. Most people you know, way different, you know, way more beginners than you, you, Jonathan, um, are, are just, you know, the trigger is because they did something wrong. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. The victim. That's, that's, like... that's where most of the culture is, but there's an evolution here and eventually people will get it that it's, it's, it's kind of part of life. It's a useful, interesting part of life to get mm -hmm. triggered and to use that trigger to go more deep into your inner subconscious where um, you didn't even know you were hurting. Yeah, that's another reason I love circling. <laughs> another reason to love circling um, is because there are opportunities within that practice to be triggered, you know, and often it's with, you know, it'll be with someone that you don't have a serious stake relationship in and so it's literal practice you know mm -hmm. where the stakes are low but the intensity of emotion is high because you're going slow and because you're really checking in and so you're even able to feel things that you maybe wouldn't feel in a normal setting with uh, you know with a near stranger and then use that as like a rep for when for when the big for when the big ones come yes yeah 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 groups like stranger groups are a wonderful place to, you know, if, if we can create the safe container like we do in circling, just a wonderful place to practice. And when I do groups 
called Annecy Salons. Um, I love that name. I used to call it, a, I, I mean, I called it a social meditation practice, you know, if, and then I heard Guy use a similar term, you know, so I was doing those in the 90s and still still do them. You know, I still offer them, but they're basically um, what circling is in a, in a sense, although um, most of the time it's it's not just one person that we stay with for very long. You know, it, it moves around. It's a little more like pop popcorn. People bring things up, say things, and then um, they get feedback or that somebody shares impact. But these honesty salons, um, yeah, it's a great place to get triggered. And when I do them online, I sometimes you can't always tell when some people are triggered because it's you know a group. So I have people hold up a pen when you're triggered just to presence the the fact. And there might be two people triggered at once. And I have other little hand devices for the for the Zoom calls because there's so much going on that you can't attend to actually that's true in any group there's so much going on in the space that you can't attend to um when i did the in-person groups i had bought these little buttons at the dollar store and i gave everybody a button this was back in the day when i was using the word you know what to do when your buttons get pushed rather than the word trigger um and i would say well we've all got buttons so now you've actually got a physical button and when you get triggered here raise your button and so I was trying to make it more lighthearted. Um, yeah. it's, it's such a heavy topic and make it more acceptable yes <laughs> normalize buttons yeah it's normal to get triggered and I've noticed that in uh being in a relationship now where uh we have a predetermined practice around being triggered and you know the our discussions of it and and stuff it's not a very shameful thing to admit now that like i'm i'm triggered and in fact it's like built into this process where well we're about to get some good work done cuz i'm extremely mad right now you know <laughs> there's like another part of me that's developed that yeah the triggering is like oh yeah here we go um yeah, but there is this way that having a relationship um, that that has that built in, it, it does feel like part of the point of love is not to make each other happy, but to make each other triggered. <laughs> and that like we are, it's like part of what I am here for you, Sai, is to trigger you. And there's like, there's a way that people you're very attracted to um, often have these patterns that you keep running into over and over in your life of like, why do I keep falling for people who do the same thing to me? And it's like, <laughs> right. And, it, you know, it's easy to, oh. to just like read the Bhagavad Gita, you, your karma, your, you haven't yeah. done your karma work yet. And there, yeah. yeah, there's just this, it's this, this yeah head turn um you know missy elliott flip it and reverse it it become the triggering becomes part of the loving and the the point of living together Def definitely I, I i you're a great role model you, you jonathan and you guys as a couple you know i want you to just keep preaching it like you're doing this is an opportunity because <laughs> i feel that way too and my partner and i do this practice too at um being able to have a practice is a you know you guys you know you you've been learned you've learned certain practices like circling but being able to read a book and digest the practice to the degree where you can actually pause when you notice you're getting triggered that's huge for couples to be mm -hmm. able to do that but then once you know that you have a practice and even a way, to, a way to repair, that too helps you not be so afraid of getting triggered. Mm. Yeah. Because you know what to do. Most people don't, what, to, what do I do when I get triggered? 
um, well, we come back and talk about it later and I try to show the person what I really meant or what my why they shouldn't have been triggered. You know, most people, the way they repair is explaining themselves again, only perhaps in softer voice tones. Right. <laughs> Don't do that, it's folks. Repair, yeah. repair is a practice. <laughs> has to keep you out of bending and explaining. Because you know, that's the wrong way to touch your partner's heart. Mm. Repair comes from revealing the need, the vulnerable core need, like, I need your help to feel that I matter. Or just, I need to feel that I matter. So the repair almost always involves revealing a need and asking for something like reassurance. Mm. And sometimes you're not, you know, the way repair goes, one person's done their repair, but the other person hasn't done theirs. And it's, it's a, it's a messy process. Repair is a messy process and you can get re-triggered. You can go, well, you need that. Well, I, you know, I'm going to give you that because what about my needs? So, you know, this isn't, this is not seamless. <laughs> this <little laughs> that I teach, you know, it's dangerous mm. if you're trying to stay completely calm during the whole thing because, you know, you might get re-triggered and then you have to do the practice all over again. <laughs> well, that, that makes me wonder, you have, distinguished yourself in your career i i believe very deeply around providing practical tools like i think it it can be very easy to write page after page on ideas of how this stuff works but then to just get simple tools that someone can actually start using today and build better connections and uh, have more meaningful relationships um yeah, I think those are are features of your work that make me keep coming back. And I, I'm curious for listeners right now, someone, you, you know, driving to work or whatever, are there like, are there like easy first steps to get started in approaching their, whether they're dating or maybe they're in a marriage or they're in a polycule of 15 people or whatever are there like universal tips that like people can start using right now yeah um well getting used to noticing your body sensations is kind of basic i was lucky i went to a lot of groups in my 20s where that was so emphasized you know just body sensation awareness and then once you're aware that there's a disturbance in the in the body energetic field, um, then you've got some important information for yourself. Mm. Um, it's like so you need some awareness practices that you have set up in your life e even before, um, let's say you try to do this with an intimate partner. So basically, just checking in with yourself or Putting putting a timer, if you have an Apple Watch, you know, putting a timer or with a little meditation bell that comes on. And, you know, just like in a meditation hall, they ring the bell and you're supposed to kind of go inside. You can do that, that on your own. So I'm all about practices that help you kind of like stop, check in, slow down. And, and this whole movement is about that. I mean, it's not me it's the, the whole idea of practice is ancient and we need practices like agreed upon time i'm going to do this or a way i'm going to do this and usually a practice is something that's kind of uncomfortable you you have to confront you know something to get out of your normal automatic routine you know to do the practice but some of the easiest, and you were looking at, you just wanted, Jonathan, something simple, or just check in with myself now and then. How am I feeling? Or after an interaction, or let's say you're on a date and um, you make sure that you plan to go to the bathroom, whether you have to pee or not, you know, and you go, how's this going? How am I feeling? What am I not saying? 
that can be a practice. Or well, same thing in a business meeting. Geez, I'm I've been quiet for the last hour. Yeah, that's because they they didn't listen to me when I tried to talk. And so I just clammed up. Okay. Let me feel my feelings and let me go back to the meeting with more of myself on online here. Yeah. Mm. So those are a couple. You guys probably know some others. I mean, they're you know, starter practices, but I think it's a great question. Yeah, the um the just the checking in. I really liked what you were saying, like on on a date, if you check in with yourself and you ask, how am I feel how am I feeling? First of all, because I my experience of first dates or like first five dates is often like managing someone else's experience. That's my job is for them to have a good time. And it's like, how am I feeling? And then the question of what am I not saying? That seems like a doorway that if you start opening that doorway more often is going to lead to uh, incredible dates and also much shorter dates when you're with someone you, you're not going to have a very mindful connection with. <laughs> it feels like that would shorten up um, yeah. <laughs> a date real nice. What you said, Jonathan, about, um, you know, first five dates, you're kind of hoping and managing the other person, liking you, having a good time. I don't know. We know that's very common. So if you go to the bathroom and you go, oh, geez, that's that's my pattern. I'm doing it now. And these are the things that I said are called control patterns. Control patterns are personality habits that kind of protect you from ever getting triggered. That's a weird there, so there, there are personalities are a defense system, you no know, personality of trying to be a pleaser or or maybe playing hard to get, whatever your thing is that you habitually do to manage the anxiety, the unknown. So you go by yourself if you can, you know, take that break and do a little of this compassionate self-inquiry that I was describing. You go, what am I feeling? What's the fear? And getting more intimate with yourself, you you have more of yourself when you come back and you know you sit down with your date and you're you're renewed. There's just more confidence. When you're more real, you're more confident because you're really playing with a full deck rather than trying yes. to, oh, you know, I can't let them see that part. I can't even let myself see that part. That's the thing where you're not playing with a full deck is you're just going on automatic. And um, that's one of the things that I'm pretty passionate about. And people love learning about their control patterns. They go, oh, man. And I've got a list of, you know, maybe 30 or 40 patterns and have people check off, you know, which one do you do? And, you know, like smiling and nodding to make people think you're interested, you know, different patterns like that. Just normal stuff. Mm. And, and people are delighted. They go, oh, man, I never realized how I was really trying to manage the other person's reaction to me. Or I was really trying to avoid them getting upset with me. Very, you know, very common, good, normal motivations. But to be aware of them and to be aware that there's some kind of pain underneath that, that you're trying not to feel. Mm. You know, it's buried in, in you know, in your childhood based unconscious so so then you know this is all about expanding you, your capacity for life eros <laughs> expanding your capacity for life oh, i love that yeah that's the theme of spring for us right now that is like both in the container but like in the yeah the path in general the path in general i noticed that that last uh, on that last kind of, I wanted to say disclosure as if we're circling right now on the, when you were talking. Um, yeah, I noticed myself kind of mourning the previous versions of me that mm -hmm. even even after the dating phase, mm -hmm. being in, in, in long-term relationships, still feeling like I wanted to... Um, manage the other person's experience of me 
and Mm -hmm. how that lack of authenticity it like you think what it's doing is it's protecting this love connection but it's actually preventing it from ever being between who the two people actually are yeah so there there's this way that um like just the having the triggering practice between Sai and myself, it routinely has me putting on the table things that for deck, just for years and years, I would have hidden. Mm -hmm. And just saying things that I think are not pretty about myself to someone who then continues to love me and support me only more so. Yes. It it has made me show up so much more as myself and like feel so powerful to just be the guy that I am who yeah gets really mad sometimes (laughs) like sometimes as part of it or you know really sad or really jealous or really you know like all of that stuff like you say it's playing with the full deck it's like it's like yeah and and I love how you tied it into Eros. There is this way that like, it just releases all the much more power to just, ah, go in the world. And yeah. Yeah. Then the opposite is insecurity. When you're hiding things from your partner, like you said, they don't really know the real you. It breeds insecurity. Like, cause they don't, if they really knew me, they wouldn't love me. I mean, it's, it's actually like a negative affirmation that you believe that's true. If they really, knew you they wouldn't love you how sad and i love that you said you're feeling some sadness about the former versions of you um, yeah me too so i um we're coming to the the close of this interview portion so next episode we'll have uh well we'll record right after this we'll have some process of so you can see Susan Campbell in action, processing a relationship. But before that, I want to, I want to end on a more path level point because, like in in getting real, you know that um, that whole project was about your own self realization and just hearing you know, far before then in your, in your twenties, being a seeker, who's like learning meditation and these presencing skills and how you, yeah, you've had this lifetime of seeking deeper connection, both with yourself and with other, and you've developed these powerful tools. And, um, I'm wondering where where you are now looking back at that path mm-hmm. how you feel it shaped your life mm. how did that shape my life the things that i will see I, it's almost like my desire to grow and learn and you know just be a more evolved person I, like even when I was ten years old, I was writing essays on what kind of person I want to be when I'm thirty. So you know, just start from that. Uh, <laughs> you know, listen to self improvement before I knew what self improvement was. So it was my motivation to be a better person that drew me to learning these practices and you know paying my own money to you know, take off from work and just, you know, do nine weeks of group group leadership training, you know, nine weeks in a row, residential. Um, you know, I was extremely motivated and I spent a lot of money on myself. <laughs> so mm-hmm. it's hard to answer how that shaped me. I guess I, I, I wanted it, well, I wanted it to shape me to feel more adequate as a person and it has. <laughs> I'll just say that, you know, I wanted to feel <laughs> really good about myself and and i do okay good yeah that was that was that what was, i wanted to do it work it's helped me love myself and feel extremely confident in the world so there that's a big sales pitch 
<laughs> make, and make a lot of money. You know, I, I've never had a problem attra attracting clients, you know. Mm. So, you know, try to, you know, and a lot of sex. <laughs> Let me just say that too, you know, because I'm an experimenting person, you know. Mm. I've, you know, I've had many, many, many lovers and partners. <laughs> If that doesn't, if making, having a career and having lots of partners doesn't sell it, then nothing in this world will Sex sell. And money, you know, <laughs> Sex and money and, and self-confidence. I think, you know, those are some great buzzwords. You know, <laughs> blow yeah. out. <laughs> um, I never went for it. I never went for any of those things. Those are just, that's just what comes when your motivation comes from within. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That I love that. That's a great <laughs> point. Uh, if people want to connect with you or read some of your books, like From Trigger to Tranquil and Getting Real, what where should they go to find you online? Susancampbell.com is my website. And I still do events. And I even do one free group coaching call a month, which you can get notified if you subscribe to my newsletter, which happens if you go to the homepage of susancampbell.com. Awesome. Thank you. We'll have the link in show notes. And yeah, uh, you sticking around for part two? Yes. Awesome. All right, cool. Thank you so much for coming on the container. I loved our conversation and you, you, you guys made my day. I mean, you're reading stuff and practicing <laughs> it and teaching it and being role models. Oh, mm. it's just, this, 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 is, this is another part of the gift. The container is now closed. So do you want to learn more about Susan Campbell's work, buy one of her fantastic books, or do you want to book a coaching session with her? You can do all that at susancampbell.com, link in show notes. And if you want to support The Container, there are a few things you can do. You can like, comment, subscribe on YouTube. You can go to the website, mm. thecontainerpod.com. You could become a patron yeah. on the Patreon. Some of that Monday. Patreon.com slash The Container. Or share this content with anybody and everybody okay and remember part two of the conversation is coming next week where you get to see susan campbell enact these principles live in a coaching session with none other than sai and myself Ooh. and we have a nice way of closing keep it nasty folks <laughs>